Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm delighted to have with me uh, today Debbie Shriver from Nashville, Tennessee, or from Tennessee, <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee, a few hours away. And uh, Debbie is a former dean of the University of Tennessee um, and an author. Uh, but I asked if we could do this interview about a book that she wrote, uh, Whispering in the Daylight, about Tony Alamo uh, cult and the children who were raised uh, in and abused in this particular cult. And Debbie, you're also involved with the International Cultic Studies Association. And I believe you have a, um, a conference that you've organized uh, coming up in February as well. Yes. So tell us about yourself and what, what you would like to say to people about your, your learning and your... I'm happy to. I appreciate being here. Whispering in the Daylight is the, is the book that um, doing this project really got me involved in, in cults and taught me about cults. I think up to the moment of, of meeting the children that wanted me to write this book about them, um, my view of cults was stereotypical. You know, I, I did, certainly didn't think I would ever join one. I thought that, that probably people who were in cults were not smart, that um, uh, they didn't have money, they weren't educated. Um, and these children broke every stereotype I ever had of cults. And I think one of the one of the big takeaways for me is knowing that any one of us could fall prey and become a cult member. No one says, I want to join a cult, but right. we, can, we can become um, victimized by coercive groups um, very easily, depending on what's going on in our lives. And that's a big message I want this book to, to give right. to all of us. Yeah, think, thank you. And and you're right. Most people uh, fall victim in, in what we call in social psychology, the fundamental attribution error, which says, you know, when we're trying to understand why other people do what they do, we overestimate individual variables or dispositional variables about them and under a, underestimate social influence variables. So why did Steve get in the Moonies? He was dumb. He was weak. He was looking for a father figure. He didn't come from a good family. He wasn't educated. All those stereotypes. And mm -hmm. none of those apply to me at all. But uh, my girlfriend did dump me and women did <laughs> flirt with me who were recruiting me. And they definitely incrementally, you know, sucked me in step by step. I didn't know they even, you know, believed in Moon for weeks. Right. In my yeah. cult. So, but so you met former members? Is that how you got interested in this first? I was, I, I write books and I particularly am interested in writing about people whose voices need to be heard. Mm. And that's kind of how I've always selected my topic. And these children were taken from Tony Alamo's cult in, on September 20th in 2008, when Alamo was in fact arrested and um, sent to justice. Um, they had been born and raised in that cult mm -hmm. and um, they were the first six who were taken. Mm -hmm. um, it took a while to get the others because there was a little bit of, of leakage about the, the uh, raid. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Tony had time to take his children and hide his followers other places. But these six children were adopted by one family. They were fostered and then adopted by this one family. Um, two, three of them are in fact birth children. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are not. Mm -hmm. And um, they had been adopted and they were living in this family. And um, just a few years later, this was 2008, 2013, um, they were not doing well. Mm -hmm. And the family who adopted them uh, tried everything they knew, but they didn't know a whole lot about their backgrounds either and what it was like for them to grow up in a cult and what it was like for them to come out of that. Mm -hmm. And so the parents, the, the adoptive parents thought that maybe it would help if they wrote a book mm -hmm. and they would get their thoughts out. Maybe they would talk to someone. And 
so I, they called on me and I went to Arkansas uh, from Tennessee and um, had a long process of getting to know each other. And I didn't believe I was the one to write this book. Mm. Um, I said, I'll learn about it and I'll find someone who can. Excellent. But I, I was drawn in. Yeah, good for you. I'm glad. I'm glad that you have the interest. I love that you want to write books to give people a voice uh, to share their experience. That's incredible. I guess I want to just say, you know, I, I was aware of Tony Alamo from the 70s. I got out of the Moonies in 76, and he was putting out anti-Semitic uh, literature on windshields of cars in Los Angeles and lots of other places. They would make these fancy denim sequin thing that some celebrity musicians would wear, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a totalist pseudo Bible cult uh, where Alama was abusing uh, uh, sexually and psychologically and physically abusing uh, mm -hmm. all the members. And yeah. fortunately, um, uh, justice caught up with him and, and, um, and, and the group is no more. But there are lots of people who have been impacted by this particular cult. Right. And I will tell you, um, this isn't something folks know, really, but the group is coming back. And they're quite strong in New York. Um, and they are continuing to pass out their tracks and put them on cars. They're, they've revived outside of um, Los Angeles. And Tony is dead. He, he ran the cult from prison. And... Now it's still going strong. So who's uh, running it? Um, we believe uh, we believe that one of um, Greg Sego. I don't know if you know these names, yeah. but we believe one of the two of the parents of the kids. I call them my kids, but the kids that I wrote about. Two right. of them, and then two other um, gentlemen who were um, big contributors, money wise, mm -hmm. to the foundation. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm not surprised. Yeah. I was uh, talking with Robert J. Lifton about his work with the Om Shinrikyo cult, the sarin gas mm -hmm. cult in Japan. And in fact, the man who was, had been head of PR for the cult uh, continues the cult. They changed mm -hmm. the name to Aleph, and uh, they still venerate the guru, even though the guru was found guilty of sarin gassing, murdering, and... And, and torturing folks and is dead. He was hung uh, a couple of years ago, but the cult continues. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's good to that, that people then really understand what this group is about yes. uh, sooner than later. Yes. And, you know, I think when Tony died, I, I met with the kids and I said, so how do you feel? You know, how does this impact you? And um, they said, well, he, you know, it kind of makes me angry. He, he got to die, but I'm left here having to deal with all, all this stuff that I've become. And I said, you mean it's more painful to be here than to be dead? You know, do you, do you think dead, death looks better than what you're experiencing? Yeah, that's now? really sad, but it's yeah. also something that I hear too much of with people who come mm -hmm. out of uh, destructive mind control families and cults. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there are authoritarian families that r are run like cults. Uh, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I think Educated was a, a very popular book about one of these family-run apocalyptic survivalist pseudo-Mormonism type cults. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of young people committing suicide, unfortunately, especially young men in the United yes. States right now. So I think, I think that, that it's an urgent need for the community, but also for mental health professionals to learn about how to work with people who were raised in destructive cults in particular, as well as people like me who were like raised in a normal family, got in at 19, got out at 22, I had a lot of psychological problems, but I had a, an essential identity to come back to and a healthy family to come back to. Whereas mm -hmm. when you're raised in a, in a totalist environment, uh, everything has to start you know, fresh in a sense. 
And when I'm doing therapy with people born in cults, uh, we have to start with, well, who do you want to be? Like, what, exactly. what do you believe in? What do you like to do? And some really rudimentary things at first, teaching people it's okay to be in your body, mm -hmm. you know, teaching people to be in the here and now, teaching mm -hmm. people how the mind works, how to have skills, social skills, of how to do interviews for jobs and mm -hmm. you know, just a myriad of different things. But let's come back to, to your book. What else do you want to say in, in your journey of writing these folks' stories? What do you think is most important? I think it's important for all of us to know that any one of us could be um, in that book. It's a, it's a difficult read. I hope, it's, I hope it's an easy read on one level, but it's a difficult read emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, it's the story of these children, and it's also the story of their parents. And it's the story of the children now as they look back and they're really never going to be completely okay in the sense of are free or away from their past. They, they're doing fine. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're working, they, they're making friends sort of, mm -hmm. um, but they're wired differently. Um, all their values, everything that, they were taught are wired so hard in them from Tony Alamo's teaching and their parents are still in the cult. Their parents chose to, chose to stay with Tony rather than to agree to take their children and raise them somewhere else when they had the chance. And so these okay. kids were just um, dejected and rejected in all kinds of ways. It sounds like they need therapy. Yeah, they do. And they I, I, I definitely encourage my clients uh, that they can create a new identity and that mm -hmm. the old cult self is over there and they can mm -hmm. be in the here and now and have a positive future orientation and mm -hmm. that they can be okay. Right. Uh, and, and they have that, that, that linkage to all that trauma. Right. That abuse. Right. Um, and they are in therapy. Um, some are more in, you know, dedicated to it than others. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're in and out of therapy. And I think in, in ways we need to, um, you know, if you're in and out of the cult, there are serious consequences if you leave a cult sure. um, in terms of whether you're welcomed back and you're often shunned. And I think sometimes I know for one of, one of these children, um, went for a little while to see a therapist and then said, because when I was doing this project, I said, you have to be in therapy when we do this for sure, mm -hmm. because I'm not a therapist. And, and as we go on this journey together, um, you need some support. Mm -hmm. And um, one individual said, you know, I haven't gone back for a while. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, I'm, I'm afraid my therapist will be mad at me you know, or I'll be punished because she had that, that image of what happens when people leave the cold. Oh, that's really sad. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, all I can say is there are therapists and then there are cult specialized therapists. And I honestly, actually, cause you know, I train mental health professionals. I think it's unethical for people to do therapy with cult members if they're not getting supervised and specialized training. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the mental health field, if somebody comes to me with an issue that I'm not trained to do, I have to refer them yes. or tell the person I'm not trained, but I will get supervision. Yes. And, but there are so many people will be, oh yeah, tell me about your story. And I keep hearing from, from folks who say, I don't know, I keep going and it's like I'm teaching them about the cult, but I'm not getting better. Right. And like you shouldn't be paying anyone to, <laughs> to teach them about your story. I mean, there is a val a certain value in just telling your story and being believed in terms of trauma work with Judith Herman and such. But this is not a, a good thing. People who uh, have been in an abusive cult need to go to people who know what they're doing and know how to create healthy boundaries how to make it safe for people to verbalize their thoughts and feelings about anything at any time. 
-hmm. hear an authority figure go, oops, you know, I made a boo-boo or right, right. forgive me. I, I, I was insensitive, you know, by not, right. you know, asking you about that. And for a cult member, that's so, wow, oh. the authority <laughs> figure is always right. They yell at you. They make yeah. you obey. So it's a refreshing modeling kind of thing, you know, for, for people who are raised in cults to meet somebody who's like normal and fresh, telling personal stories, which is what I was told mm -hmm. not to do when I was initially trained as a therapist. Mm -hmm. Don't share your personal story. <laughs> like, oh, over a decade, I realized, you know, that's what people want to hear that yes. we, they can connect to. Yes, you know, absolutely. You know, and, and so anyway, um, it, it hurts me to hear that, that people are still suffering uh, and not, you know, really done done with their cult involvement. That, there are uh, many. And uh, that's one real takeaway I have from this experience. Um, this getting to know these kids um, truly turned my life right side up. Mm. Um, I'd never seen the world that way. Mm -hmm. in all the ways that I, I really know, I mean, I've always, you know, I've experienced as someone who grew up on the outside, I've experienced loneliness, I've experienced being um, made fun of and all kinds of normal things that we experienced growing up, mm -hmm. but I had never experienced what they experienced. Yep. And um, so I, and I heard, heard their troubles as hard it was how hard it was for them to integrate into school. Um, they didn't have birth certificates just to get a passport, um, get a job and all the kinds of things you need to do just to know how to work it out here, yeah. how to play the game out here. And um, from the day they were taken, um, they, you know, people out here, I think I, I sort of thought you were rescued. Mm -hmm. No, they were taken. They were taken from the only home they knew. Mm -hmm. And so everything out here, um, their perceptions were based on what they were taught. So they believed they would be killed, yeah. literally. Yeah. And so I started realizing people, the DCS, police officers, um, lawyers, everyone that comes into contact, kind of the first step contact with these kids, didn't know how to do it. Right. Um, people in the foster parents didn't know how to do it. The people in the school system didn't know how to do it. Right. So I really, I guess my little piece of what I want to do is to create education um, opportunities for people out, out here in the workforce who are likely to come into um, cult survivors or people who are taken from cults, however that happens, and be able to help them and really connect to them and know how to do that. It's, as you said, that's so important. Yeah, this is my work. That's yes. what I feel the same way. I work yes. into the spirits. And I'm really, oh, go ahead. And I, I, I guess I, I can't help but, but uh, just state the obvious, at least obvious to me, that when you're raised in a, in a, uh, even a political system, whether it's the Soviet Union or Chinese communism, uh, you don't know what's normal. Like that is normal. And then if you're out of the Soviet Union and you're placed in out here, in you know normal world or american world mm -hmm. it's a similar problem people don't know how to cope they they don't know how to ask questions they have all these phobias and fears they have all of these issues with identity right uh, they're taught to distrust themselves and and have an external locus of control to some external authority figure instead of the healthy developmental thing of learning how to think for yourself and mm -hmm. how to make good decisions for yourself. So I guess I, I'm taking your point, but I'm wanting everyone who's listening to this to realize there are millions upon millions of people the world over who are the same problem. Yes. This is not just a few little cult members, you know, dotted across the landscape here or there. I want to mention the Jehovah's Witnesses in particular. Mm -hmm. 
that have over 8 million people who've been involved and many times that who were involved and left. And, and this whole notion of uh, shunning and phobia indoctrination that Armageddon is going to happen mm -hmm. at any moment. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently, uh, with the assassination of the uh, general in Iran, a lot of JWs are hunkering down because they think the apocalypse is going to happen now, mm -hmm. right? And even ex-JWs who have never done their homework and understand cult mind control are thinking about going back in. Yeah. because yeah. of the external news stimuli that's bringing up all their childhood indoctrination. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really difficult for us not to be impacted by what is in here from childhood. And all of a sudden, there it is. And we connect it arbitrarily to all kinds of events out here. And that can really, that's, again, a good case for having a therapist it's a good case for building relationships with people you can really trust. Yeah, and, um, very true. And yeah. uh, I'm, I'm heartened that there are uh, now a battery of former members who have come mm -hmm. out and become mental health professionals and mm -hmm. who have decided to make uh, this one of their areas of specialization. And that's happening all over the world. Yeah. Um, but again, there's this notion of uh, a, a stigma that there's something wrong with you if you were in a cult uh, versus a healthy curiosity of, wow, you you yes. grew up in that. Tell me more. Yes, You're yes. Amazing. You're doing <laughs> so well. Yeah. <laughs> and positive things. Yes, yes. Um, you know, and I think one, there are many, many moments that my, my kids have had the kids in the book, um, you know, and it's, it's often, at what point do I tell this person I was in a cult? Um, do I right off the bat or do I get into a, a close relationship and then spring it on them then? And it's difficult for them to even know how to negotiate their relationships with people outside of cults. And one kind of neat thing that the International Cultic Studies Association has done, I think, has through workshops has brought cult survivors together from different cults. Right. And, you know, they end up saying, wow, there are other people who have, who know what I mean, who get it. And then that helps them make one more step out there. Yeah. And I want to just emphasize that um, the therapeutic value, like when I was in the Moonies, coming out of the Moonies, the therapeutic value. For me to listen to an ex-Scientologist, <laughs> I went through, and it was so obvious that was a cult, right? Yes. Them, it was so obvious I was in a cult. Yes. Right? And then I'd meet an ex-Krishna, an ex-Children of God, then I met, you know what I mean? Yeah. So to be in a, in a, in a therapeutic or a, a support group awareness uh, retreat type of situation where you can meet people from other groups who are willing to share mm -hmm. their amazing stories. And it's, it, it's a psychological truism, but it's easier to see the, the, how screwed up things are over there first. Right. <laughs> then go, hmm, I, my group actually did a version of that. You know, right. My group did a way worse than your group. Right? And, and right. Um, it's, uh, it's not, misery loves company. It's not that. It's more like um, uh, illuminating. It's more mm -hmm. like, wow, another intelligent, you know, a cool person who got, you know, bad draw of the cards where they were born or how they, you know, got recruited into this cult. And now we get to be friends. Right. And, and, and um, I guess I also want to just comment about your, your the the raising of the point about uh, disclosure, like how much mm -hmm. how much to tell, how soon, and whatever. And I teach my clients about imagining different rings of 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 trust and intimacy out there. And you know, you don't want to tell a lot of this stuff to someone that you're not going to have a close relationship with. 
uh, you know, it depends on how you're going to know them. Are they a coworker? Whatever. If it's someone that you want to date and get to know, uh, you don't want to lie to them if they're asking you about your past. But you can say, you know what? It's a it's a long story, and if you know if our friendship, if we like each other, and we get to know each other, and I feel safe with you, I like to share it. Yes. Yes. But, but this also the idea of reciprocity, right? Because mm -hmm. when you're right. recruiting for a cult, you want to find out everything about the recruitee to get them in, but you don't tell them anything about the cult. Exactly. Right? <laughs> right. But in a real relationship, you want there to be balance, you know, mm -hmm. and if someone's asking you personal stuff about your background, you can say, well, why don't you start and tell me yes. your, you know, family of origin and Yes. What skeletons do you have in your closet <laughs> about right. your relationship history? That's uh, right. Uh, but honesty is, is I think, really important value. And that's another problematic thing for people coming mm -hmm. out of cults, because typically cults are teaching deception and mm -hmm. doing deception all the time. Right. And we see that out here, too, don't we? <laughs> I'm afraid so. <laughs> yep. uh, one of the... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, one of the the other kind of uh, insights I stumbled on was with one of the the young women um, of of this group, and I were talking uh, well after the book came out. We were at a book event, and and um, it's we always it's wonderful to get one on one with my kids as opposed to the whole group from time to time, and she. Um, was telling me again about a moment when she was um, walking back to her house in the cold and she heard her father who is a is still a real big guy in the cold mm -hmm. um, and she heard her father yelling at her little, little sister and he was saying I'm gonna take you to Tony I'm gonna report you you're gonna have to be beaten for this and her little sister was about eight and she was 13 and she she said at that moment i just hated my father hated him and as she was telling me this she was feeling a lot of pain about the fact that she was capable of hating her father and mm -hmm. she said that's horrible and i said wait a minute tell me how old you were again she said 13 and i said let me tell you something there isn't a 13 year old girl anywhere who hasn't hated a parent at that time and it's not it's not a vicious hate it's the it's a normal kind of you you know now you had an, a situation that was not normal certainly that triggered that that hatred feeling but at 13 14 15 um, we all want to send our kids to boarding school because they're really difficult to deal with in your, because you're wanting to be independent and yet you're wanting to be taken right. care of. And I said, it's a normal um, step in human development. And she said, you're kidding. You mean people out here experience that too? And I said, yeah. And she said, there's a point that I'm normal. And I said, no, yes, if you want to call it that. And so then she said, well, let me ask you about this. And she brought up another time. And I said, yeah, I remember that with my daughter. And then she bring up something else. And I'd say, no, that was definitely the cult. That was not something that we experienced out here. But she then began to find these moments of connection with the human beings out here. Yeah. And that's so important. Yeah, I'm struck by your use of the term out here. Uh -huh. <laughs> in, in reality versus right we're reality. all mm -hmm. it's it's very interesting and i guess because you brought up the, the 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 beating i i would you be comfortable talking about some of the abuses that yes. people had to endure in this cult yes and i think that's what makes the book difficult to read it made it difficult to write as well um the first of all the families were all torn apart children didn't necessarily stay with their mothers and fathers the fathers were often sent off to work other places for months at a time and um everyone sounds like had, the boonies sounds like yes that's apologies. right sounds like fundamentalist latter-day saints that's right top of my head yeah and oh. these kids these 
<laughs> these kids started working um, when they were eight years old. Mm -hmm. And they did go to school. It was homeschool, of course. It was their own school. Um, they went just till about sixth, seventh, eighth grade level. And the boys and the girls never, never could have contact with one another. And um, they were doing grown up jobs starting at eight. Um, I asked, like, as we talked, one of the young boys um, said to me, we had fun. We had fun, too. And I said, what did you do that was fun? I don't hear it. I don't identify with fun and what you're saying. And he was telling me about how he um, put roofs on houses in the summers when he was eight years old. And he said, well, I got to play with nails. And, you know, in that moment, I thought the human spirit, the child's um, automatic way of seeing creativity and fun happens for all of us, no matter how horrible and con constricted our environments may be. Yeah. And even growing up in a cult, you can have awareness right. of this is wrong. Right. I hate my father. This is wrong that he's right. threatening my sister. Right. And, and for some kids report like always wanting to run away as soon as they could, you know, find the means right. to exit. They, they, they never got indoctrinated and as a true believer. Mm -hmm. If I may, I want, I want to come back to mm -hmm. talking about more abuse, but I just want to touch on, you mentioned they were homeschool, of course. Well, that's not normal. A lot no. of people who are in cults go to public schools. Uh, and I guess I want to just comment that there are some really healthy homeschooling Absolutely. curriculum, especially where kids are socialized and yes. things are oriented yes. to their strengths. Um, and then there are mind control, indoctrination, homeschooling, which is yes. done on millions of Americans yes. uh, right now that undermine any type of normal psychosocial emotional development. Thank you for clarifying that. I did not intend for, for that, the other implication to come out. I said, really, of course, because they were not allowed out of their compound, right. out of their place to live. And in fact, their curriculum was the Abeka curriculum. And it's a very, very good um, basic education curriculum. And when these kids got into public school, they knocked the socks off kids of their age. They were um, up to the level that they were taught, they had very good skills with math and writing and reading. And right. the consequences for not doing well were very severe. Mm -hmm. They would be beaten, um, beaten so badly um, that they couldn't sit down. Yeah. Um, one young man had was gifted in playing the piano, and he they did music was a big part of church. And that's the one thing they all really loved. Because mm -hmm. um, the boys and the girls actually sang together in a choir. And, and I so love singing in the Moonies. That was one of my favorite activities. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. And they loved it. And he played the piano without any lessons. He could just feel those, that keyboard. And Great. Um, if I may, Debbie, I want to co meta comment on one other thing that yes. has wide applications. And that is corporal punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a great website called StopLegalChildAbuse.com by a friend and colleague of mine, David Cooperson, who was a former uh, social worker, child protection advocate who had been beaten as a child. And there, there are, there's literally physiological damage, psychological, emotional, mm -hmm. physiological damage from hitting children. Mm -hmm. And it's just, if anyone still spanks children, uh, please stop and please read his book. It's called The Holocaust Lessons. I actually have a blog about it and an interview with him. But uh, in the Lamo cult, they use the stick. They had a, a two by four uh, board that was, if you think of a rowboat and the oar that you use for a rowboat, yep. it was basically that. And they drilled holes. Paddle. Yep. Yeah. Huge paddle. And every man had one, and they drilled holes in the in the flat part so that it would have less resistance and hit harder. Right. And yeah, though it's horrible. Talk about sexual abuse and and neglect 
uh, those are two other major forms of, of abuse. Absolutely. Um, Tony Alamo was extremely abusive to women from day one. When his first, um, well, when the first, the, the woman Susan with whom he formed the cult, that wasn't his first wife, but um, while he was, while she was alive, he abused other women but we don't have any reason to believe he had um, sexual contact with girls, young girls. Um, he may have, but it became much more um, relevant to this discussion when, his, uh, when Susan Alamo died. And sure. for lots of reasons that we might imagine, he really um, became a child predator. Mm -hmm. And he had his own house and he would select girls to live there. Um, girls as young as eight years old, he would take as his wife and um, keep them in his room for days on end and um, show them videos, mm -hmm. pornographic materials and say, this is what I want you to do with me. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very mean to them, um, degrading to them. And he believed that, well, he preached that if a girl once a girl started her period, she was a woman and could be taken. Mm -hmm. um, he also gave permission for these little girls to marry um, others. The only polygamous person in the mix that I know of is Tony. Mm -hmm. um, now, there were, when women were, were left, if a, if a wife left and but was still married legally, um, he, did, he, he did not adhere to that. He would say, you can be married again. Mm -hmm. He did not see that that woman's, um, that that man would be um, committed legally at all. Once, so the legal bounds of marriage didn't, didn't fit there. The yeah. malignant narcissists like all the <laughs> other cult leaders think they're above the law, grandiose, right. you know, no, no empathy. Uh, you know, lies constantly, abuses others, threatens right. others, is paranoid. Uh, the whole laundry list applied to Tony. And that's why he went to jail, right? Because of abuse of children? Yes, he did. He was, he, he violated the Mann Act. That's what they, viol what they were able to get him on. And mm -hmm. that is that he was taking some young girls across state lines for illicit purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was actually convicted um, for, at that time, two, two young girls. There were many, 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 and later trials have came up for restitution for those young girls. Mm -hmm. um, he also had a house that was called, it was a greenhouse, and they called it the House of Scorn. Mm -hmm. And for girls and women who didn't please him, he would banish them to the House of Scorn. Mm -hmm. And one woman in particular was in charge of that house. And um, they would be basically held there, um, a jail, if you will, for it could be weeks at a time or even longer. And um, on the walls would be Bible verses um, pointedly saying how horrible they are and how they're not living up to, to God. Um, the, the abuse was really horrible mentally as well as physically. And there was also fasting mm -hmm. and children could have nothing but water with a little lemon in it or coffee um, for a week or two at a time. Wow. I yeah. fasted for seven days on just water twice. Oh. In the 20s, but to have a child do yeah. it is, uh, it's really severe. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is, um, it really is a destructive mind control cult, and it's disturbing to me to hear that that they're trying to uh, recruit new people into it. And um, do they do they venerate Tony Alamo still? Do they call they it do. Alamo? They um, they for a bit it looked as if they were changing their name to the Helping Ministry. Uh huh. And um, but they still refer to Tony Alamo and the flyers, the tracks are still Tony. Um, if you go to the website, it's still the Tony Alamo Christian Ministries. And um, they actually have a restaurant now in Manhattan. One of his MOs was to have a restaurant with music. Um, stars would come and sing and he would provide free meals and then 
take the, the customers or the recruits to another area and preach to them and, and indoctrinate them. And in Manhattan, they have such a place, right? Near Penn oh, the State. name of it off the top of your head? I can't remember the name of it off, off the top of my head, but- You'll you email it remember. to me while I add I it. will, I will, and- um, To know about it, for sure. I, yeah. I, I know that uh, the Yellow Deli was outed recently in Boulder, Colorado, which is part of the Messianic uh, yeah. communities, 12 tribes. They also beat children, and they think that oh, they're- Oh, they're terrible. Jesus. They're strong in Chattanooga, not far from here. They have a Yellow Deli there. Yeah, so I, I think creating more community awareness about, you know, uh, cult businesses and 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 obviously I'm a big advocate of encouraging people who who know what they're doing to reach out to people in cults, make friendships, kind of like if you ever decide you want to leave, let me know. That's um, right. <laughs> kinds of things, uh, you know, especially with battered women shelters, letting them know well, there's a sexual violence hotline uh, mm -hmm. that people can call. Uh, and there's um, uh, the, uh, the center in DC that John Walsh set up, the uh, yeah. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, uh, are linked with the FBI and, and other agencies to, to follow up on any abuse mm -hmm. claim with children. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes, um, but we covered a bunch of ground. Um, I guess I just want to ask an open-ended question. Okay. So, uh, but I also want to mention that you're doing a program at your uh, University of, of Tennessee uh, in Knoxville. We are actually with the University of Tennessee Knoxville College of Social Work and the International Cultic Studies Association. We are going to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it's a, it's a, a kind of a centralized in this region place. Okay. And we're seeing it as our gift to Nashville. We're gonna have a day, it's Saturday, February 22nd, for um, people that work on the front line Great. to learn about cults. And um, we're, we're real excited about it. We're gonna, kind of teach what cults are and then what to do if you have a friend who um, may be in a, a coercive situation and um, then finally talk about community and as com communities, how can we be safer um, and healthier for people. The, the conference is called Coercive Control, Cult and Community. Right. It's free. It's our gift, so it's free with even a free lunch. Great. So you'll you'll give me info. We'll add that to uh, to the blog as well. Thank and you. we want to encourage other communities to network with uh, mm -hmm. other colleges uh, and schools of social work. And uh, I've been teaching fourth year psychiatry residents uh, the wow. last few years, um, but uh, I think you know more social workers would be a great a great contribution as well. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for everything. And you're on the board of the uh, 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 com is the website, the International yeah. Public yeah. Studies. And uh, the hope is, is to create more uh, support systems for ex-members, for families who are worried about loved ones, um, to train mental health professionals. And of course, um, in this political environment uh, mm -hmm. that we live in right now, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote The Cult of Trump. Uh, people, uh, some people are like, yes, of course it is. And other people are like, no, you're the cult. Uh, <laughs> but I think that understanding Lifton's eight criteria, uh, uh, Margaret Singer's six point conditions or my bite model mm -hmm. are some frames that are useful to give uh, education to folks um, about what is a destructive cult and, and how to protect yourself. So with that, I'm going to thank you, Debbie. Thank you. I and really I appreciate it. look forward to seeing you again. And hopefully I'll be down in Nashville and maybe try sure. to come over to Knoxville or whatever. Hey. Um, in the near future. Thanks Great. so much. Thank you. Okay.
Okay. Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm 